Debbie Partika here from the School of Journalism at the University, and I'm here with Joey Gilbert. We're going to continue on his interview. So we're going to go back to his boxing career. What was the most important thing you learned from boxing? Most important thing I learned from boxing is that you can, uh, you can win or you can make it through or you can finish it no matter how bad it is, no matter how beat up you are, no matter how broken down things are, you can, it just, it really is, I think, up, 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 upstairs. I think it's mm -hmm. mental. I think so much of it's mental. And I can't tell you, uh, I mean, there were times in boxing where I just wanted to take a knee and go to my happy place. And I mean, I mean, broken ribs or just, like I said, broken nose and, and every punch is hurting. I mean, you're feeling it. And I can't tell you how many times, and even in college, wanting to give up or, or thinking, you know, this, heck with this, this is ridiculous. But, you know, answering that bell and going out there and, you know, a minute later dropping the guy with an overhand right and winning the fight and winning the title and thinking, God, that was awesome, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I didn't give up. I'm glad I didn't, you know, right. succumb to my, my, the weaknesses in my mind or wherever. And so I think the most important thing for me for boxing is just that, you know, stay in the fight. Always keep punching, keep moving, keep, uh, mm -hmm. keep believing in yourself and don't give up. And that's, that's right. worked out well. So with that, um, it's kind of surprising how soon your boxing career ended. What was it exactly that ended it? There's different things that the media say, but what really ended your boxing career? Um, what really ended my boxing career? At the end of the day, um, there was stuff that had happened in the, uh, with the Athletic Commission back in 2007 and 8. Mm -hmm. But why it ended in 2010, right at the end of 2010, was um, a concussion. And actually, it wasn't a concussion. It was more than a dozen. So this was, I think, from what I could count, mm -hmm. 14. Um, that's from what I could count. Mm -hmm. And that going, that's starting back to the university days, yeah. you know, in, in 97. So um, most of my, my uh, concussions or times I've, I felt where my head was really rattled happened in practice, mm -hmm. happened in training, happened fighting a heavyweight, sparring a heavy stuff that you just, when you're young and you think you're invincible and you do anything, um, there were times where I definitely know, and when I sat mm -hmm. there with the doctors and talked about it, where it was a concussion. And so what happened was on my last fight, September 25th, I believe, 2010, at Grand Sierra, I was hardly hit at all by, by the gloves of my opponent. But I've never been headbutted so many times under my chin, my temples, mm -hmm. and it had me so foggy and like disoriented, I felt like I was going to throw up in my mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And I actually took a knee in this, and this is a fight I was winning. I was ahead on all three judges' scorecards. This is, mm -hmm. you can look it up. Uh, I would have had to lose, I would have had to been knocked out in my hometown, which is just not going to happen mm -hmm. ever. And I would have had to been stopped by a TKO or knocked out to lose that fight. And in mm -hmm. the sixth round, I took a knee. And you see me, I'm shaking my head because I had this pounding headache, felt like I was going to throw up. And mm -hmm. for the first time ever, the ring was kind of foggy. And my, uh, I guess, educated um, side kicked in and said, this, this isn't good. You know, your, your head should not be doing this. I actually took a knee and stood up and told the ref, I'm done. And he said, are you stopping this fight? I said, I'm done. I just, at that moment, and I can honestly mm -hmm. tell you that I felt like, use a little young gun scenario, that my spirit horse for fighting kind of ran, ran out of me that night, just rode yeah. out. And a lot of it had to do with my daughter. She mm -hmm. was a year old. Um, she's definitely the most important thing in my life. She's definitely my priority. She's definitely number one across mm -hmm. the board. So thinking that my mind wasn't going to be there or that I might be hurt and not being able to take care of her, it was actually a very easy decision and very quick mm -hmm. because uh, the test the next day confirmed I had another concussion and that's when the whole concussion discussion happened. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if you think back to it, 2010, we have stuff across the NFL happening like crazy with the concussion stuff. So um, I ended it. It was actually mm -hmm. based on that decision, sitting around with friends and family, that I said, okay. And the, and, and the other little sub part to that is I have a herniated disc, uh, C5, and between C5 is a, it looks like on an MRI, it looks like there's a nail pointing to my spine. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the thing is that in uh, the early part of 2011, I was having all kinds of pain, and I went in to get an MRI. The, the long and short of it is, they said I had a herniated disc and it wasn't 
didn't just happen. It had been there from yeah. the years. So actually my neurosurgeon, the true end of my boxing career was I was still remain, remaining positive or thinking, you know what, I can still fight again even though I've had concussions, mm -hmm. I'll let things heal, I won't fight for nine months or whatever it is mm -hmm. and I'll come back. But I went into this neurosurgeon's office and they said, you know your boxing career is done. If you get hit again, this could be it. So that's the truth. That's why boxing ended concussions mm -hmm. and a herniated disc. So did the controversial reports of the media with the steroid use, mm -hmm. the, those types of things, did that affect you a lot mentally as you were going into these fights? Well, the things that affected me mentally with those, with the reporting, first of all, there's a couple of things that are important. Number one, I absolutely did have some stuff in my system and I had amphetamine in my system because I had been taking Adderall at that time by prescription, which was on file with the Athletic Commission for years, mm -hmm. for at that point in time, you know, seven, eight years. I've been taking mm -hmm. it since 1999. Yeah. So uh, one of the things you, you don't know until this happens to you is that when you've been taking something so long and you go off it, your body has to go through a period of time before it doesn't show up in there anymore. And my doctors were wrong. 72 hours was not enough time. Mm -hmm. I needed like 10 days. And for Valium, the other stuff they found in my system, which I took mm -hmm. on a USO tour, I went over to see our troops and coming back, they gave me something to sleep. That'll stay in your system for 42 days. So there's just stuff you don't know. So I have to say a couple things. Number one, it's my fault. It's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for what you put in your body. I knew that even though I put those uh, medications on file and, and, and knew about them, um, I needed to be better about you know, how they mm -hmm. stayed in my system, the half-lifes and all the crazy stuff mm -hmm. I learned. So I will say that it it definitely um, affected my, the way I felt, um, but it didn't affect how I felt about my, um, my abilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew that there was no reason I had been as successful as I was in college and everything else by mm -hmm. any cheating or any, you know, uh, fake means. So that didn't affect me, but what I didn't like is, is, the, is what was being said then, because mm -hmm. obviously it's like, oh man, if these guys knew how hard I've trained and how much I've disciplined, and that for me to still be fighting at 160 when I graduated UNR fighting 160, you know, mm -hmm. almost eight, nine, ten years later, um, that's not by taking steroids. I mean, I'm calorie deficient. I'm not eating. I'm like, you know, running crazy miles. So I was, that affected me in that regard. But then again, I had answers and knew why it happened. So that gave me some, I guess, comfort. So did, did all of that have to do with your interest in the medical marijuana industry and the dispensaries and lobbying for that, did all of that, how you realized how that kind of impacted you, you wouldn't want to happen to someone else, or how's that? Well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a kind of couple questions and answers to, to all that there, and that is um, medical marijuana side is a, different, is a different animal in the sense that I've seen what that medicine can do, and I've been blown away by the results I've seen people have with it. Um, mm -hmm. Young kids, uh, people my age, veterans with PTSD, I mean, just been unbelievable. So that's one side of it. But for me, with regards to, um, I guess, the, um, I don't want to say medical marijuana, but doing what I'm doing and why I'm doing it with different uh, natural medicines and naturopathic stuff mm -hmm. had to do with back what, what did happen to me is that there were other alternatives that I wish I would have known about mm -hmm. that I didn't know. So it's like, you know, there's, there's a couple different things to consider mm -hmm. when you look at that. I didn't get into that because I was so interested in it. It was just something that is a, is a what do you want to call it? It's like a, it's like a tag on, like an add on mm -hmm. to what I was trying to figure out, right. which was all the stuff that went on with the commission. And, you know, were there other alternatives to this? I learned about uh, lots of stuff in mm -hmm. natural medicine. And that's um, what led me into that. Great. So you mentioned earlier that you were a member of SAE on mm -hmm. campus. Are you still in contact with a lot of them, and how did they, how did that organization impact you as a person? Um, being, I, I think that being a member of any fraternity um, at this university and other universities is is a really cool experience because if you are from this town or you're from the area, and all you know are all your high school friends, well, you get up there and you meet tons of other people. A lot of them from here, a lot of them not from here, and so um, that impacted me in the fact in in the sense that all the people I'm doing business with right now. Everybody that I'm working with or working through, I met through my fraternity. Yeah. It's the funniest thing in there. I'm talking business partners, uh, guys that are in partners with the cannabis business I'm doing, guys that are involved in um, some of the different real estate, I mean, some of the different mm -hmm. other 
partnerships I'm, I'm doing are all from the university and the fraternity. So I think it provided just a whole nother, uh, just networking. Network, yeah, and a whole nother just class of people I never would have met. Mm -hmm. So that, that did a lot for me in the sense that I met older members of the fraternity that became mentors and guys right. I've been able to lean on. So um, this is kind of separate from that, but Body and Soul, that was a movie that you actually Oh yeah, um, with uh, Ray Mancini. Can, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about that? Actually, that the movie Body and Soul was they needed they needed uh, bodies. They needed boxer people to be in like the background mm -hmm. of a f of a fight film that Ray Mancini, Boom Boom Mancini, was filming. And he was actually very good friends with the Carano family, mm -hmm. and he had one of his big fights here uh, back in I think the late late eighties, early nineties. So I did that just as like an extra, and it was really a very cool experience. It was fun. It was fun. That's cool. Um, so. Another TV show that this was actually for your, I'd say more so for your career. How did the Contender impact your boxing career? Would you say that well, was a big part of why it blew up? Yes, the Contender is absolutely responsible for why anybody that was on the Contender that did well, um, did well because mm -hmm. you got the exposure and the notoriety that you would never get. I mean, when are you ever going to fight on national TV? And we're not talking national, regional. We're talking national primetime television, and it was syndicated in almost every country. So it was a big deal. And I wouldn't be where I'm at, where I am today, in, at least in the sport of boxing, and probably in law, if it wasn't for that little boost. Mm -hmm. So I'm very lucky. So if you could change one thing about your boxing career before or after the contender, what would it be? If, if I could change one thing, I would have signed with Top Rank and Bob Arum, and not tried to do it all myself the way I did. I had my own promotional company, still do, and it, it was very hard to do all that yourself. And I'll never forget Sylvester Stallone telling me, uh, how are you gonna drive, push, pull, fix, shine, and everything with Joey Gilbert bust at the same time if you're also trying to, to do these things. So if I could do one thing, I'd say, uh, I'd, I'd let go a little bit of the, the control aspect of it and would have put it in more, not just capable, but, but hands that you know, uh, had the time and had the experience to do it, so. Right. Right, so then in college, would you change something about what you did in college in regards to education or career in boxing or law or medical? Like, would you change anything at all? The only thing I changed in college is I would have went to Spain instead of Italy, so I learned Spanish so I could actually communicate with all my clients. And um, that's probably the only thing I changed in college. And then in uh, moving into the professional ranks, I definitely would have been more careful with the medication issue and the whole thing that went on there because, um, and this is something I'd say to you, and I, and I speak about this to kids all the time, is that mm -hmm. you know, you're always looking for an edge and you're looking for a legal edge. And I was definitely that guy that went into GNC or whatever nutrition mm -hmm. store there was, and whatever was in that lock box, that yellow, I mean that, that plastic box that you, know, you had to have the key for and it said you know, testosterone booster and lean muscle enhancer. Not only did I get those, but if they said take three, I took 13. You know, I mean, that's just what kind of guys mm -hmm. did. You know, you just take extra because you mm -hmm. think it's going to do more. And I still, you know, one of the things that the commission found or that was found in the after fight drug testing was one metabolite of a steroid. And I passed polygraph tests and I sent, you know, my testing, my, my sample to an Olympic lab and they couldn't confirm it. But it absolutely had to come from the, I mean, I was taking so many different supplements because you think more is better. And mm -hmm. you think that, you know, that's going to help you. So I, I, would, I would have been a little more careful in that regard. And mm -hmm. I just would have um, just been a little bit more mindful of what I was putting in my system right. and knew and known what it was going to do or what it was not going to do because I probably didn't need it. It probably didn't do a damn thing except mm -hmm. cost me money and put me in, you know, mm -hmm. jeopardy. Yeah. So. Um, so does that correlate with anything that you would change in your career as a lawyer? Is there anything you would change? Um, if I could change anything in my career as a lawyer, what would I change? I don't know that I would. I mean, I've had a great career as a lawyer so far, and it's you know just getting started, and I'm, I'm learning. Every day I learn more, and I have great mentors. So, I mean, just keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's no real way to become good at something besides doing it. There's no, there's no shortcuts, really, I think, in life. I don't think there's anything such, such as a free lunch in life. I think you pay for everything. And so I'm just putting in my time. You know, I mean, I've got to, you know, that's what you have to do. 
So. So you've you've mentioned a lot of mentors and role models. Who would you say was your biggest role model growing up? Uh, biggest role model growing up was probably my father. You know, just until college, and then out of college, I'd have to say a gentleman I met through the fraternity, Sig Rogic, who is still plays a huge role in my life in terms of when I need to ask someone if this is a, a good or bad idea or bounce some ideas off him or his staff. That's who mm -hmm. I reach out to. So. so he's also your, he's impacted you most as a lawyer as well? He's my go-to. What about think. as a boxer who impacted your career most? I think my younger days as a fighter were impacted most by watching guys like Oscar De La Hoya on TV. And mm -hmm. uh, um, God, Oscar De La Hoya, I'd have to say, um, played a big role and then just the guys locally. I mean, Nick Mills Lane, Vic Draculich. Um, there's a lot of local fighters and fight support referees, guys involved in the sport, Mike Martino, Pat Shaleen, guys I went to, to the college program uh, under and with that I think impacted my boxing mm -hmm. career as a pro. So to close this up, what is one thing that, one piece of advice that you would give to like the future generations of America? Ah, the future generations of America, I would say, uh, be active, get active. I don't think there's ever going to be a substitute for exercise, for getting out there, for what it really, I mean, it's not me, it's science, so argue if you want, but endorphins and everything it releases in your body and the fact that your body's meant to move. So I would say that those generations stay active, you know, um, get involved in sports, have hobbies, do stuff outside, because these phones and computers are going to kill us if we don't, you know, maintain our, our independence and our, and our active role. And I would say, um, learn a second language. That's what I would tell the other generations. And the last thing I would say is, just because it's text messaging, just because it's email, learn how to communicate. Be able to write an intelligent. Um, everything today now is correspondence. And I think, you know, where you guys are, are at right now in, in your journalism school, I think the finest degrees you can get outside of if you're going into medicine or engineering or something that are English literature journalism. Because if you can't, communicate effectively, especially now in this generation, in this age, where so much of it is done over a computer, over a text message. When I get messages from people that are spelling, you know, stuff, like short stuff, I, and they're my age or they're another professional, I, I, don't, I don't really think that's mm -hmm. right. I think that, you know, that's something that's going to be very important. I mean, with today's spell check and everything else, people don't spell. They don't they can't remember numbers. I mean, we're using less of our brains today than we ever have before. And so my, my word to the next generations would be stay active, uh, learn another language, and learn how to communicate effectively through written word uh, because that's what you're going to be doing. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Sure. Yeah.